Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark on the rise of the Canadian dollar. TSX Venture Exchange President John McCoach discusses the need for an uptick rule in Canada. Gold miners have the attention of Addicted to Profits.net publisher David Skarika. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Nice to be with you, Jim. The Canuck buck finally tickles 80 cents U.S. for the first time in a long time. Is the U.S. dollar all that healthy right now? Well, the, uh, the U.S. dollar has started to uh, crack through some pretty significant support areas. The, uh, the 90 foot, when well, we look at a basket, um, and that index has been, had a, just a fabulous 18 month run into uh, February, March of last year, and has gone through a consolidation phase between 94 and, uh, and par um, ever since. It's had multiple tests of the 94 level. And from a technical perspective, you know, when we see something that tests a support or resistance for three times or beyond three times, uh, the probability is that you're going to end up cracking through. And in the case of the dollar, we've had half a dozen tests of this support level. And uh, this week it gave up the ghost. And uh, that came on the heels of a Wednesday announcement from the Fed that they were doing nothing with in terms of raising rates in the United States and continuing along with the same general commentary uh, regarding monitoring you know, inflation, the state of the economy, but in, also the state of the uh, economic conditions worldwide. So minor move down on the dollar that day. However, overnight, the Japanese, who had been expected to come up with another stimulus package, uh, didn't. And we have seen about a four and a half to five percent rally in the yen since then. Um, also, we've had the the euro come to life, and so with this, the dollar index has broken pretty significant support level, and with it, the Canadian dollar has managed to, as you say, get up and touch that eighty level. Now, from a uh, short-term perspective, looking at maybe daily uh, data from the last six or 12 months, uh, for the dollar to be breaking down here, um, our target is at 90. Um, for most people, that might seem like a fairly good-sized move, you know, at three and a half, four percent But when you look at it in perspective on a weekly or monthly basis, this will end up being, uh, we believe, just about a Fibonacci, a 38% correction of the rally from 2011. And that would be the normal spot for the next support to come into place. And uh, that's that's what we're going to be using as our guideline for now. And uh, with that being the case, it's going to have implications as it did over in the precious metals. Canada doesn't have any gold reserves. China's been snapping up all the gold they can find. Is that a dangerous move on Canada's part, or can we count on the gold that's still in the ground? Well, Canada's been selling off its gold reserves for a couple of decades now, and they just got, in the last six months, they finally got around to just letting the tail end of it go. But really, that was a, just a drop in the in the bucket compared to what they used to have. So that, this has been, say, a concerted effort on the part of the Bank of Canada to uh, to let the reserves go. And I don't I don't see that as a as a catalyst or as a significant piece of action at this point. Um, the we never really were a a gold backed currency. We've been a a commodity backed currency more so than anything else. And uh, when we see the uh, the strength that we've had in the oil market and in commodities in general this year, 
that's indicative in terms of why we've now had it must be about a 13-week rally in the Canadian dollar off the bottom. You take a look at the, the Commodity Research Bureau Index, the move there, the green move, um, soybeans, corn, wheat, soybeans, corn, and wheat, uh, all making really good, uh, well, probably 10 to 15 percent moves off their bottom, and that that's had uh, quite a good impact as far as the dollar is concerned. We've seen oil push up to the uh, $46 level as of this week. And um, the um, the oil market for us is looks as though, from a timing perspective, it's maybe got another week or ten days left in this run. But we've got the type of um, readings that we see nine consecutive weeks uh, closing well, um, and uh, with some other criteria in it. And this, the historicals would suggest that we top out at least an interim high within the next week to two, uh, look for the next correction. Rather than being into the low 30s, which is what we were originally looking for if we had topped out around 40, now that we're topping out probably in the 46 to 50 range, going to be looking maybe at the high 30s for the support level in the oil. Will the driving season have much of an impact? I know it started early because of good weather. Well, uh, you know, we've seen uh, the uh, the gas prices uh, move up, and that's that's part of a normal characteristic here. The the seasonal play on oil, on the gasoline is that you buy it at the end of January, the first two weeks of February, and you see a rally into May. Um, we've had exactly that. If I take a look at the ETF on the oil market or the gasoline, you know, we've gone from 20 and change up to 28. So. It's it's already had a pretty good run off that bottom. Most of that, as far as from a trading perspective, is probably priced into the marketplace at this point. And yes, you'll see increases at the pump, but uh, for in terms of the wholesale levels, that uh, that move is probably 80 percent behind us right now. And Ross, before we go, you do have something to offer for people who were looking at the precious metals. Right. Uh, we've taken a look at uh, the strength here that we've seen in this sector and done some, uh, you know, uh, updated the comparisons with uh, previous events. And I think that uh, the piece that we put together uh, will be interesting uh, for the, the listener. So uh, if they would uh, like to give me a or send me an email at ross.clark at cibc.ca. We will um, forward them on uh, a report that we put together. Thanks for chatting with us, Ross. Back with you next week, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark, Investment Advisor at CIBC Woodgundy, Vancouver. Coming up, TSX Venture Exchange President John McCoach on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Unbelievable harmony, spectacular performance, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel. Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band coming to West Vancouver Friday, May 6th at the K-Meek Center. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is John McCoach, president of the TSX Venture Exchange. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. John, welcome to This Week in Money. Thanks, Jim. Pleasure to be here and appreciate the interest in TSX Venture Exchange. The Venture Exchange recently did a number of ta- town hall meetings. Where were the town halls and how were they received? We did it. Uh, we had about a dozen town hall meetings uh, across Canada. Uh, of course, we had town hall meetings in the four major cities that we have operations uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, and Toronto. But we also went to places like uh, Halifax, Kelowna, Winnipeg, uh, Regina, Saskatoon, etc. So um, we really got great feedback from from literally coast to coast in Canada. And um, I think they were received very well. There was, uh, you know, each one was a little different. Um, there was the Vancouver Town Hall had a, uh, about a dozen or eight people that were uh, were quite concerned and, and uh, raised a number of issues. Uh, but for the most part, I'd say the dialogue was constructive and we got some good ideas. So I'm very pleased that we did them. 
we wanted to hear all points of view. And, you know, what I took from that was that people care. Like, if they, uh, they, they feel passionately about this market because it's so important, um, not only to the people that are directly involved in it, but to Canada. And and I'm so glad that people came out and had constructive ideas, but also to hear the passion and the, from the people that um, were concerned and um, are challenging us to to do other things. In your March 2016 progress report, the town halls were asked, "Do you believe short selling has a material negative impact on the market?" Fifty-seven percent responded, "Yes." Reintroduce the uptick rule. Well, let's talk about the uptick rule. We've All been right. doing a, a series called Killing Canada's Junior Markets, where structural problems in the junior markets have been discussed, along with other issues. The uptick rule is at the top of the list. Do you agree with the respondents that the uptick rule should be reinstated, and are there a number of options available to reinstate it? Well, if I may, first of all, with all due respect, Jim, I think that's a terrible name for a series, but uh, I would much rather we all focused on how we can... Uh, revitalize, rebuild, and uh, reclaim the strength in the junior capital markets in Canada, which is something that I think we should all be very proud of and, and want to see succeed. So um, I, I prefer to focus on, on the positives, but I'll, but I'll address your specific question about the uptick rule. Right. Uh, I personally uh, think an uptick rule is appropriate for a junior market. Um, it's an appropriate check and balance for companies that are have less liquidity typically, uh, although the liquidity has been improving recently uh, quite a bit, and, um, and where stocks can be a little more volatile. So I think uh, an uptick rule uh, is, is a good feature of a market, uh, particularly a venture market. Are there ways to reinstate it? It's difficult. Uh, it's possible, but it's, it's very difficult. Which regulator has the power to reinstate the uptick rule, and are you lobbying them on behalf of listed companies and shareholders? Well, the uptick rule, um, or it, it was a or a tick rule, it used to be um, was repealed in 2012. In fact, actually, it wasn't an uptick rule at the time; it was uh, repealed. Um, it uh, it just couldn't sell uh, short on a downtick at that time, but it. Those, those rules came under the Uniform Market Integrity Rules, which are uh, enforced um, uh, by the Investment Industry Regulatory Association of Canada, IROC. And uh, yes, we've been having conversations with IROC. We've had a number of conversations with IROC. IROC's very interested in, in finding a solution, but as I said, there, there is no easy solution for this one. If the uptick rule is not reinstated and the junior resource stocks are in a bull market for a couple of years, could easy money be made by continually shorting the stocks on the downtick all the way down? And would the selling momentum resemble a pump and dump? I think there's a couple of different issues in there. First of all, in a in a bull market, uh, I think the um, or let me rephrase, if in a bear market an uptick uh, or the lack of an uptick rule could have more of a negative impact um, because you've got general momentum pushing the market down and, and selling on a downtick to speculate that the stock's going to continue down just exacerbates that. Um, in, a, uh, in a bull market, um, you know, obviously you can, you can put pressure on a stock, but if the the momentum of the market is upwards, um, it, uh, it becomes far more risky to be selling short. So I, 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 don't, I don't think that has really anything to do with pump and dump, and uh, I think that, um, or that concept of pump and dump, and I think the, um, that the market is much more a, um, susceptible to, to problem trading uh, in a downtick or with a downtick in a bear market. There are 13 trading platforms for the TSX Venture stocks in Canada, including the TSX Venture Exchange. Is it true 90% of trading in the Venture stocks is done through the Venture Exchange and the remaining 10% done through the other 12 platforms? 
uh, April 21st, we traded uh, 88% of the trading on the venture stocks happened on the venture exchange. So it's close to 90%. It varies anywhere from the high 80s to, to 90% typically over the last few years. Now, that doesn't mean that the balance of the 10% is equally spread over the other alternative trading systems that are in Canada, but uh, it, in theory it could be. Could the uptick rule be reinstated to work on each of the 13 platforms separately? I think that's when I mentioned that it'd be challenging to reinstate an uptick rule. That That is one of the challenges because each marketplace would, first of all, have to be agree. Um, n- not that the marketplace is necessarily... Uh, dictate if uh, IROC can Im- uh, or the Securities Commissions can Im- implement trading rules and the marketplaces have to abide by those. But uh, when you've got uh, a fractured market system, it's, it becomes difficult to determine what the, actually the last trade was because when you're trading in, uh, trades happen in milliseconds, it's, it becomes a technolog- technology challenge to look at all those markets to actually see what the last trade was. The regulators are said to have opened the markets to additional trading platforms to avoid the ongoing monopoly of the TSX. Now, 12 platforms are responsible for 10% of the trading, while the TSX venture is responsible for 90%. And the end result of this is a market without an uptick rule. For the greater good of the market, could the venture be open to negotiating deals to end the participation of other platforms trading TSX venture stocks, thereby resulting in a single trading platform where the uptick rule could easily be reinstated? Well, first of all, Jim, I wouldn't say that the the, um, the multiple marketplace is a global phenomenon. This is not just in Canada. So in the... Uh, uh, in the United States and Europe, uh, they have many more markets than, than Canada has actually. And, um, so this is just a, uh, part of the evolution of capital markets generally that there are multiple marketplaces in there for trading. So the, and I also would say the, the repeal of the uptick rule in 2012 or the tick test in 2012, uh, was not necessarily directly related to the creation of or the evolution of multiple markets in, in Canada. It was uh, the Canadian regulators uh, wanted to be harmonized with the United States, which was a re- repealing an uptick rule. And there was a lot of studies done, um, and you can agree with them or not, that the uptick rule uh, wasn't really benefiting the market. So, so the decision was taken to, to repeal it at that time. That was happening at the same time as multiple markets were coming into Canada, but they're not, the two aren't necessarily linked. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, to clarify that. If there was a single trading platform, would the result be a first come, first served order book, and would that restore confidence in the junior markets? I think multiple markets creates confusion. Um, a, and people, uh, that have trade, particularly I think in the venture market, are used to dealing with the, the great system that we have in Canada where they're very transparent markets. It's time, price, priority, um, and I think the Canadian market structure is, is, is as good or better than any in the world. The, so from that point of view, it would simplify things. People wouldn't, um, you know, if they go to sell stock on a bid or, or buy stock on an offer, and by the time their order gets, you know, routed to different marketplaces, sometimes that, that offer or bid are not there anymore. And they don't understand why they didn't get the fill that they would have got in years past. And that creates some discomfort in the marketplace. So from that point of view, I think, uh, a single market for venture stocks would, would they, um, help people feel more comfortable trading. Now, having said that, uh, you know, I think most people would say, well, of course TMX wants to have a single market for to trade the venture stocks because, you know, you just want to have your monopoly back. And uh, I personally believe that the um, that a single market for early stage stocks, like on the venture exchange, is best for the market. As you pointed out, we already have 90% of the trading. This is not about 
you know, us trying to to a go back to the good old days for our for the benefit of our market. It's it's for the benefit of the capital markets. We're speaking with John McCoach, president of the TSX Venture Exchange. What could the TSX Venture Exchange offer clients and listed companies to eliminate the call for competing platforms in the future? I'm not sure that we could really offer anything, Jim. It's a uh, it's a decision that was made that um, uh, to open the markets up uh, for competition by the securities regulators. I think it would be the securities regulators that would have to come to the conclusion that um, that a single market was better off for everybody. Should shorting be banned for all stocks under three or five dollars? I personally don't think so. I think shorting is an important uh, feature in a marketplace. Um, it's a it balances off over exuberance in, in a market. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, I think a, an uptick rule is an appropriate governor, if you will, to um, uh, particularly for more volatile, less liquid stocks. Some junior stocks from time to time are being hit with a board lot size sale on the downtick in the last half hour of trading. To combat this, is it possible to mark the tape with the last trade on the venture exchange, but not other platforms? And or could board lot sizes be increased for stocks under 10 cents and under 5 cents? And ultimately, would reinstatement of the uptick rule solve this? Well, there's a couple of things in your question there. Um, The first one about board lot sizes, um, I think that's quite an intriguing idea. And uh, this came out of the, um, this idea came from a stakeholder. um, And while we were having the town hall discussions and and when we're reaching out to get this kind of feedback from, from clients. And so this is one of the reasons I was really pleased that that we did this reach out uh, to to stakeholders in the marketplace because it started a lot of dialogue and we literally received hundreds of great ideas, including this and sort of different variations of this idea. So we're looking at that board lot size and seeing uh, because that is something that is in our control and seeing if it uh, would help the market. So. This is why it's so important to uh, to work with stakeholders. Is it becoming easier for American investors to invest directly in Canadian markets? Sadly, I think it's becoming more difficult. Um, you know, I've I've been in this business for a very long time, and they uh, I you know recall when it was just as easy for an American to trade in Canada as it is today for a Canadian to trade in the United States. Like if you or I go to buy shares on an American market, it, there's no issue. It's very simple. Um, in my view, uh, it should be just as simple for an American to, uh, to trade in our markets. But for a lot of reasons, that's not the case. What could be done to improve that? We're, we're looking at that. Uh, that's a very, one of the, the, the tactics that we've identified, um, in our white paper. A, we're working very closely with securities lawyers who have do a lot of cross-border business with dealers who do a lot of cross-border business. We're talking to the regulators here and in, in the United States and trying to identify the issues that you know we can um, where maybe change is possible. I, I wish I could tell your listeners that uh, I've found that smoking gun and uh, and we're trying to address that. But, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Hopefully, the long and painful bear market in the resource stocks is turning bullish now. Some people have been calling companies with negative working capital zombie companies and calling for their removal from the venture exchange. Could these companies be kept on the venture exchange and charge zero fees by the exchange until they're in a positive capital position? Well, if I... I, I want to, uh, first of all, address your first point in that question. Uh, I... Uh, I am really pleased to see the trend in the marketplace right now. You know, it's not appropriate for me as an exchange operator to be commenting on uh, or giving investment advice or commenting on on uh, you know where the markets are going. But uh, when you look at uh, the venture exchange in the last few months, it's it's really been phenomenal. The our market is um, since the low in January 20th, the venture exchange index is up. 
forty percent. That's that's absolutely incredible. It's uh, the venture exchange has outperformed every uh, marketplace in the world year to date. Obviously, it, the index came off quite a bit from the at uh, the highs, but it, the trend is looking very positive. And, and I and I'd say even what I'm even more excited about uh, this week, um, we had the last three days we traded. Uh, 300 million shares or more on the venture exchange. In 2015, the average trading volume was 130 million shares, which is which is still you know very reasonably healthy for a junior market. But now you know trading 300 million shares is fantastic, and that's I think that's such a positive trend. We haven't traded 300 million shares in a day since 2011, so I'm very excited about uh, uh, about the trend in in the venture market. With respect to the so-called zombie companies, well, first of all, that's not a term I would use. I would never, I would never think of uh, of our clients as, uh, as, uh, as that way. Um, and and I recognize there's there's some people who feel that we should be uh, aggressively culling the market, um, but that's that is a minority view, and there's really no evidence to suggest that that would benefit the market. And, and in fact. In reaching out to all of our stakeholders um, and 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 getting a lot of feedback on this issue, um, it's there's there's absolutely no reason to to make a change that a, uh, to where our continued listing standards are. And on a principled basis, I don't think it's fair to move goalposts on people. We've had the same continued listing standards for which is the bar that we set. When a company um, a no longer meets the TSX Venture Exchange standards, if it drops below that, we move that company to a board we call NEX, which is a board that was created about a dozen years ago for companies that drop below the standard and give them a place to hopefully reactivate, whether that's a you know raising capital, you know a, finding a new asset to develop, and then they can move back up to the venture market. Well, since Next was created, over 300 companies have done exactly that. They have been moved down to Next, and they've now um, restructured, refinanced, and have moved back up to the venture market. So I'd say that model works exactly as it was contemplated when we created it. So I don't, I'm not contemplating moving that bar. We could. Um, I think there's a good argument that we could make the continued listing standards bar um, more simplify it, and and we are looking at that. So, Jim, I'm not sure that answers your question, but uh, that's that's my current thinking. Is it time to end the accredited investor program so that the little guy can invest in private placements that have warrants attached? With a caveat, he signs risk disclosure acknowledging the placement he wants is high risk. Well, I, I absolutely believe we should be continuously looking at prospectus exemptions or ways for, um, for everybody to participate in the venture exchange. Getting rid of the accredited investor exemption doesn't solve that problem. The accredited investor exemption is, is one tool to help companies access capital. We just need additional tools. Getting rid of one tool doesn't, uh, doesn't solve the problem. And probably most of your listeners know that in Canada, basic, the basic concept when you're going to, company's going to raise money is you can't issue shares from Treasury without a prospectus. That's the principle. And then there's something like 40 exemptions to, to that basic rule. The accredited investor exemption is one of those exemptions. Um, but there are many others and the good news is the securities commissions in Canada, I think, are becoming more and more open-minded to being creative and finding other ways. Um, and this is something that's really important to us. We've lobbied very hard um, and worked with the commissions, and they've been very receptive to finding, uh, introducing exemptions like the existing shareholder exemption. Some provinces in Canada recently introduced what they're calling the dealer exemption. That idea came from um, some members of of the TSX Venture Local Advisory Committee, and we're fully, you know, very supportive of that. So, uh, a rev- reviving the uh, or uh, 
um, updating the rights offering regime in Canada, which was which happened in December last year, was is a huge um, a huge change. So I applaud the commissions for doing that, and we're already seeing more companies um, access capital via rights offering, which of course is a, a great tool because it gives all their existing shareholders the right to participate. So I think the short answer to your question is the accredited investor exemption is is great. Let's let's find other tools for investors to access the capital and for companies to raise the money. The junior capital markets in Canada need help from the regulators and exchanges. Independent investment houses focusing on the junior markets in Canada are disappearing from the landscape. Overregulation by regulators is being blamed. Is overregulation also hurting the TSX Venture Exchange? The um, well, of all of the issues in the marketplace that I lose sleep over, uh, the health of the dealers, particularly the independent dealers that have traditionally been great supporters of early stage public companies, um, that's that's probably the biggest issue. Um, it's a disturbing trend. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful that the uh, the increase in trading volume, the increase in share price, and will lead to more financing activity. In fact, we're already seeing that trend, um, and that will help the dealers. And uh, I, uh, you know, I want to do everything I can to support them. But regula- regulation uh, for listed companies hasn't really hasn't really changed uh, much in many many years. Um, it's um, it's really about the availability of capital. So if if the regulatory costs stay relatively constant, but companies have access to to less capital, of course, just you know by pure math, the that cost of capital as a percentage increases. What we have to do is a um, is get the availability of capital higher, but we have to also focus on those on the cost side of that equation too, and that's what we're doing. That's one of the three strategic priorities that we've got, and we've got a lot of ideas, uh, and we're working on a lot of things to do that. Are the regulators aware of structural problems, overregulation, and other issues plaguing the junior markets in Canada, and are they actively working on solutions? Well, I it's not my place to speak for the regulators. Uh, my experience is they're very um, aware of the issues, they, they care, um, and... Uh, you know they'll they'll want to do uh, they want to do what they can to help, but um, the you know at the same time investor confidence is really important to them as it is to us. You the reason why Canada's public venture capital markets are as strong as they are, um, you know for you know for many years. So we're not just talking about one cycle, is because investors have confidence in in participating in early stage public companies and that's not the case in many other places in the world so we definitely don't want to to risk that investor confidence if you were in charge of all junior markets in canada for a day what would you do to make canada's junior markets the best in the world i thought i was in charge of the junior market in canada (laughs) but um the i would i would do exactly what we're doing I would um, reach out to stakeholders and get many, many different views and uh, uh, from across the country and uh, and beyond as well. Uh, last week I was in uh, we I went over with five mining companies and uh, we met with 60 fund managers um, in London and in Zurich, a total of 60 fund managers, and we spent literally hours chatting with them about all kinds of issues related to the market. So it's really important to get the feedback from that the buy side perspective as well. Um, continue to get those ideas, identify things that we can where we can help, and um, and which we have done, and then based on uh, w- which we outlined in the white paper that was published in December. Then we we went across Canada and talked to over a thousand more stakeholders, shifted our tactics a little bit based on that feedback. And I think the issues that we've identified or the tactics that we've identified are the right ones that are going to help the marketplace. So what I would do is 
is exactly what we're doing. And I think, you know, based on the feedback we're getting, um, the vast majority of stakeholders feel that we're on the right track. How important is the TSX venture exchange to the Canadian economy? I think it's incredibly important. Um, if you just look at one number, uh, 600 and I think it's 30 companies have graduated from the TSX Venture Exchange to the Toronto Stock Exchange since TSX acquired uh, acquired Venture in 2002. And about many of those have gone on to be, you know, big companies in Canada. In fact, 20, I think it's about 24% of the TSX Composite Index are made up of companies that have graduated from the junior market. So some of Canada's biggest and most liquid companies were incubated on this marketplace. And if you, you think about the thousands and thousands of people that those companies have employed uh, as they as they grew their business, it's it's really important to Canada. Um, you know, you go in any any community in Canada, and whether it's mining companies, oil and gas companies, technology companies, life science companies, um, many of them have had, you know, got where they are because they've been able to access public venture capital. And that's, you can't say that for many places around the world. This is about helping people with great ideas access capital so they can grow a company, add shareholder value, and create uh, employment. It's to support entrepreneurs. That's what we do. That's what it's, uh, every stock exchange should do. TSX Venture Exchange is very focused on that. John, if people had questions for the Venture Exchange, how can they get a hold of you? 604-643-6507. I love to talk to any clients. John, thank you very much for being on This Week in Money. My pleasure, Jim. My guest has been John McCoach, president of the TSX Venture Exchange. Coming up, David Skarika, publisher and editor of AddictedToProfits.net on This Week in Money. I'm Larry Ray, president and CEO of American Manganese Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is David Skarika, publisher and editor of AddictedToProfits.net. David, welcome to This Week in Money. Hey, um, it's, it's great to be here. David, the U.S. market's down quite a bit today, whereas gold had a, a really nice charge for one day, but it's been on a, a growing streak over the past few months. What's the connection between the two? Well... I really think what's happening is, in terms of the stock market, I'll get more into that a little later, but um, in terms of why this is happening, is that the U.S. stock market is a very artificial market in terms of it's basically based on this cheap money and and um, stock buybacks and all this sort of thing. It really should be much lower than it has been, but this cheap money has kind of inflated it and and st- I think really we should have been rolled over by now, but th- again, this cheap money has kind of um, uh, g- kept it higher than you know longer than it should have been. And then the gold is kind of sensing two things: number one, that the global economy is very weak. Um, you have serious problems in places like China, and um, um, and in a lot of other emerging markets, and you know, Brazil has problems almost in a depression. And gold is, and is, is sensing this. And then number two, they're also sensing that I think the way the U.S. dollar is trading and gold is trading, it's basically telling you that the Fed is one and done with the rate hikes. It's a total, they're, you know, they're just trying to act like they're going to do something, but they're going to do nothing. Some of it is political. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the economy. It's just not that strong. And, and, and the biggest problem that these guys don't get. We're going to catch 22 right now, or as I watch Trailer Park Boys, as Ricky, Ricky would say in a Trailer Park Boys, we're going to catch 23 situation, right? That um, basically the problem the governments are in is that 
if you want real lending in the economy, rates are going to have to be at three or four or five percent, and you know the long bond at five or six percent. But these governments around the world are so broke they can't do that. You know, if you had the U.S., which debt to GDP is over 100 percent right now at six or seven percent, the country would be essentially bankrupt. So the problem is, is that you need higher rates to entice banks to lend. And, and high rates would also help because if the baby boomers retiring, they would then have more income to retire off uh, and, and spend it in the economy. But the governments are so broke, they can't afford it. So this is like this catch-22 that's going on that the, the, probably 6% rates would be much better for the economy than 2% rates. But the government cannot afford that. And, and, and so you're kind of in this push and shove. But, but also these low rates, tend to help asset prices. You know, if you go look at the earnings growth in the U.S., or earnings declines, more likely, um, the market should be much lower than it is right now. But why is it? It's like you have McDonald's, 3M, Boeing, all of these um, big multinational corporations are able to borrow at cheap levels, keep their dividends high, keep their stock filing. And so you might say, oh, I'm going to rather own a McDonald's and with a 3% yield then own, um, you know, a U.S. Treasury at a 1.8% yield. So even though McDonald's doesn't really have any growth, or 3M, or Boeing, or all these companies, United Technologies, whatever it may be, these companies have no growth, but I'll own them because it's better than owning a government bond. But I think the market's also sensing that, you know, um, in terms of the gold market, sensing that rates aren't going any higher. And I'd rather be in gold, even though it doesn't yield anything, because it's real money and and um, uh, things are getting worse, and obviously that the negative interest rates in Europe and Japan aren't working, and the U.S. isn't going to raise. So I'd rather be in gold and precious metals. I think what's essentially happening right now, you know. What's better, gold bullion or the gold miners? I think the gold miners are still better. Um, uh, obviously, you should always own some gold bullion. Because it is money. If you got a big stock market type crash situation, they probably hold up better than the miners. But um, uh, the miners are so cheap compared to gold. You look at, for example, the HUI to gold ratio, which is something that since the HUI came into fruition in the late 90s, and you go look at a, a 10 or 15 year chart of that, you'll see it right now it's 17%. And what does that mean? That means that the HUI is roughly one sixth the price of gold. Well, at the bottom in 2008, it was 20%, so one fifth. At the, at the ultimate bottom in gold, when gold was 250 in 2000, it was 13%. And by the way, on this move to the downside late last year, it got to 9%. So the golds are so cheap compared to the price of gold, and I think there's two reasons for that. Is number one, the gut miners did a lot of strategic errors. You know, they were, you know, buying, um, um, uh, um, things at inflated prices, and then gold turned around, and they had huge debt loads. So the, co- the companies became more leveraged, and a lot of them were in danger of going under. Gold stayed at like a thousand to eleven hundred for a num- for a while. So that was that. And number uh, that was one reason. It was the ETFs for gold are now such a huge part of the gold trading, gold stock trading, that when everyone was getting out of their GDX or GDX JDF. That these ETFs all own the same thing. You've got to sell all the same stocks as the outflows happen. So that pushed the stocks almost too far, uh, it, it, you know, uh, reflexive to one, uh, you know, one direction. And now they're reflexing to the other direction because now, just like everyone got out of those gold ETFs, now everyone's getting into them. And, and, and that is pushing the price of the stocks um, higher, the gold miners, et cetera. China, of course, has been on a gold buying spree for the last five years. The Canadian government sold off all of its gold. Who's made the best move? Oh, China is doing the much. See, Canada and Australia are unique situations in that they're both small, you know, countries with roughly thirty and twenty million people, and they have large resource sectors. So the gold in the ground in China in Canada makes up for the fact that the central bank may have sold it, right? So they luck out from that department that, like, you know, the British have basically sold most of their gold, but Britain doesn't have a gold mining industry, obviously, right? 
So, you know, that the goal that the central bank have is all the goal the British really have, where Canada and Australia luck out from, like, if the price of gold goes higher, well, then you're going to get mining investment in those countries, you're going to get jobs in those countries, you're going to get some inflow into the currencies, et cetera, et cetera. So, obviously, the Canadian government made a terrible decision, and the first Trudeau and Mulroney both did the same thing, and uh, now the second Trudeau is following in his father's footsteps in that regard in terms of selling the gold reserves off. But but the problem you're going to get, again, is that because mining is such a large part of our resources of the Canadian economy, it's not going to hurt as bad as it would a, another country who sells off. But obviously China is making this strategically smart decision buying gold at these levels. The Russian Central Bank is the same. And one thing that's really helped Russia is even the oil's rebound. But when oil was going to new lows, the currency wasn't getting decimated because essentially um, what was going on was the central bank in Russia was buying uh, um, gold, uh, you know, while oil was selling off, and that was helping supporting the currency, because if you look at the gains now that the Russian central bank has on these gold purchases that mostly happened between eleven and $1,200 an ounce, that really helps the currency. The Canadian dollar is at, a, I, I would say, a multi-month high around 80 cents, the U.S. dollar, an 11-month low. What's happening with the currencies? Yeah, yeah, well, a lot of the Canadian dollar just has to do with the balance in oil. Like, it's very that simple. It's, a, it's an algorithmic trade. There's the, you know, all the funds that trade this stuff based on these mathematical formula, formulas. The Canadian dollar and Australian dollar just trade with the price of oil. Now, I am not nearly as bullish in the short term in oil as I had gold. I still think we need one drop into oil into the low to mid-30s. Like right now, I only own one oil stock compared to having dozens of precious metal miners. Um, and, and the reason that – or actually, I own two oil stocks, so I, I, I should uh, – you know. But anyhow, um, and the reason being is there's too much of a supply gut in oil. So I would think even though the Canadian dollar, I think at 68 cents, has hit the bottom, now up to close to 80 cents, we will get a pullback into the late 70s. When, and if you go look at the last two years, 2014, 2015, oil basically peaked in this March, or sorry, sorry, this May to June area, and then fell for the year. I think a very similar trade is going to happen this year, where maybe oil, I don't know if it goes to new lows, but it could definitely go back to 30 or $35 a barrel, and then you'll see the real decimation in the frackers, because the frackers are probably just hoping and praying that oil goes over 50 and that next move lower, probably over the summer and fall, will really decimate them because most of those fracking wells are only good for about two years. And, you know, they'll have no higher hedging prices. They'll have no way equitable because basically the bond market is frozen for the oil and gas companies in the United States. And then you'll see the big uh, – we've already seen about a six or 700,000 decrease in oil production in the U.S. or six or 700,000 barrels a day. And I think that will add on another million barrels a day. And right now, the oversupply in the world is about one to two million barrels. So if the U.S. falls 1.7 to two million barrels off their high, that essentially gets rid of the oversupply, and oil can move higher, and then the Canadian dollar can also move higher. And I think another factor in the Canadian dollar will be after this decline, and the reason you'll want to buy it is we all know that Canada has a housing bubble, but I think what's the more important factor is the U.S. is going to take back that rate high by more QE, probably late this year or in 2017, and that will essentially really devalue the dollar. I think they'll do it late this year because, <laughs> if I'm correct, and the next leg in the stock market has begun, that is, increases the chances of, say, Trump being elected, and that he is not into this QE, he's not into this cheap money. He's actually on record saying that. I, I think he actually will fire Yellen. And, and so they're going to do the QE before there's any show political change uh, uh, to, to occur, or do the QE to try to keep a political change from occurring. So um, I definitely think when they do the QE, that will actually offset the Canadian hacking oil prices, because that will really devalue the U.S. dollar. And, and the reason being is this. Why did the U.S. dollar spike? It spiked because there was this assumption in the world that Canada's cutting rates, Australia's cutting rates, Europe's negative rates in QE, Japan is negative rates in QE. So while all these other central banks are loosening, the U.S. was going to be uh, tightening and doing three or four or five or even, you know, ten quarter point rate hikes. 
that is obviously not going to come to fruition. And when they start to ease again, that has to come out of the U.S. dollar trade. And look, it's not about the U.S. even being the cleanest of all shirts. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's just a trade based on the U.S. was going to tighten monetary policy and everyone else was loosening. And that trade is now being unwound. China, I know, has ambitions of being the world's trade uh, reserve currency. Do they have any shot at that? Um, not in the short. China's got a huge, I kind of tend to, in terms of a trade, I tend to believe uh, George Soros, Soros on this, um, that China has a huge debt bubble, and it's too large to get out of. It's about 350% of GDP on the private and public combined which is actually now higher than the United States. And this bubble, they're, they're now uh, basically, you know, decreasing lending standards and loosening policy just to keep that bubble afloat, for, regardless of it, you know, forget about expansion. So I think that at some point this bubble will implode on itself, and then the giant Chinese debt situation will not look as good because like Ireland, like the United States in 2008, um, Iceland, all these countries that blew up, the UK, um, they're going to have to then take on the debt, the bad debt of the banks, and then you're going to see the, that, that private debt be transferred to the government balance sheet, and that China is not as strong as, as people think. And again, like I don't like to get into politics, but if there is a chance of Trump being elected, he's also going to crack down on the trade policies going between China and the state. And that will also decrease the trade um, uh, surplus that China has with the United States and also mean less money coming in there. So I don't see the Chinese being – I'm no fan of the dollar, by the way. I think the dollar, like in the U.S., is, you know, they have over 100 percent debt to GDP at the federal level, 120 percent if you include the states and, uh, and um, um, municipalities, actually much higher than Canada. I think the U.S. is actually a, a, a fiscal basket case. But with China being a basket case, I just don't see them taking over in the short to intermediate term as a reserve currency. Are there any stocks that you would put any trust in right now? Yeah, I've been buying some precious metal miners. I actually showed on a video I did on my website last week that one of the portfolios that I trade is actually up 50% year over year. And the reason being was, number one, I was short the market late in the year. And that market tank, you know, through ETFs in this portfolio. And when the market tank, that, that started helping it. And then what happened was in late January, early February, I realized that the good risk reward scenario was not so much on the short side, but to the precious metal miners as they were showing uh, um, signs of breaking out and the smaller miners, the kind of companies that have one large exploration company or that have uh, one uh, large ex- exploration uh, property, sorry. And then also, have say one large one mine that they can also increase production on. These are the companies that are leveraged in, that when you get a turnaround in the early 2000s, in the 2009 to 2010 period, when you have these moves off the low in gold, these are the type of companies that can go up 100 or 200 percent. They went up a thousand or 2,000 percent. So I kind of shifted in some of these miners, and some of them are already up between 50, 100, 200 percent, etc. And um, that that is where I would still be. So if there's a big in the stock market, they may get hit in the short term with that. But I really like these smaller precious metal miners. That especially if gold gets over thirteen hundred into fourteen hundred, it's going to be very lucrative for them to mine, drill, and they're going to have the, the capital markets open up to them. And I really believe that's where you want to be right now. We are in a five-year bear market for the precious metal miners. Historically, that's one of the longest cyclical bear markets on record. And, you know, I really think that we're near the end of this and we're in early stages of a multi-year bull market in these. So what I do is I own those with about a 20 to 30 percent short position, either via, via ETFs or just selling stocks options to kind of protect myself in case there is a big move down in the market. And the thing was, is if you get a big move down in the market, I figure that 30 percent short position will probably return about 100 percent. And then you'll more than, or at least 50%, and you'll more than make up to any losses that you have. So that's kind of what I'm doing. The smaller gold miners, some be- I saw some beaten up stocks, um, 
uh, it, you, one technology stock, one aerospace company, but um, mostly the smaller precious metal uh, mining companies mixed in with um, uh, short positions on the market, and I think that's kind of a good portfolio right now for risk reward. David, how can people find out more about Addicted to Profits dot net? Uh, you go to uh, Addicted to Profits dot net, just the website. Uh, I have a free email list you can sign up for, and I do videos and interviews such as this. This was on the list. I try to do one or two a week, and then if you're interested and you like what you see there, you'll see a whole bunch of old interviews and and videos that I have on there. And then you can just subscribe to my newsletter when I do one of my special deals, which I I'm actually probably going to do one rough. David, thank you very much for being on This Week in Money. Okay, thanks for having me. My guest has been David Skarika, publisher and editor of AddictedToProfits.net. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, John McCoach, and David Skarika, and thank you for listening. Comments or questions for the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.